of the Metallurgical and Materials Engineers Association, NIT Trichy, I welcome you all today. I request all the participants to kindly keep their mic in the mute mode during the session. In case of any doubts, I request you to kindly post it in the chat box, which would be addressed at the end of the talk. It is rightly said, knowledge is power. Information is liberating and education is the premise of progress in every society, in every family. And our guest today is a firm believer of the same. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our honorable guest speaker, Dr. Yuri Gogotsi, sir, who has accepted to grace us with his August presence for the Orem guest lecture series organized by the Metallurgical and Materials Engineers Association, NIT Trichy. Our guest today is a distinguished university professor and Charles T. and Ruth M. Back Professor of Materials Science and Engineering at Drexel University. He also serves as the director of the AJ Drexel Nanomaterials Institute. His research group works on 2D carbides, nanostructured carbons, and other nanomaterials for energy, water, and biomedical applications. He is recognized as a highly cited researcher in material science and chemistry and citations laureate by Thomson Reuters Clarivate Analytics. He has received numerous awards for his research, including the ACS Award in the Chemistry of Materials, Gamow Prize, European Carbon Association Award, and S. Somia Award from IUMRS. Sir has been elected as a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science, Materials Research Society, American Ceramic Society, the Electrochemical Society, Royal Society of Chemistry, International Society of Electrochemistry, as well as the World Academy of Ceramics and the European Academy of Sciences. He holds honorary doctorates from the National Technical University of Ukraine, Frantevich University Institute for Problems of Material Science, National Academy of Sciences Ukraine, and Paul Sebastian University, Toulouse, France. He has also served on the MRS Board of Directors and is acting as an associate editor of ACS Nano. So it is a great privilege to have you with us today for this guest lecture. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, let me share uh, my screen uh, with the participants. Um, uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, very good here. So again, uh, good morning. Uh, well, good morning for me. It's a good evening for everyone uh, in the audience. Uh, my name is Yuri Gagotsi, and you have just heard that I'm serving as uh, associate editor of ACS Nano, so I'm wearing a shirt with the ACS Nano logo, and you can see ACS Nano in my background, and you also will see quite a few papers from ACS Nano today because we published much of our work in ACS Nano. What I'm going to do within the next hour or so, I'm going to talk about materials that some of you may be familiar with, some other may not, that are called maxines. We pronounce this word maxine, where M stands for transition metal, X for carbon and nitrogen. So those are two-dimensional carbides and nitrides of transition metals. Uh, you can read more about those in a book we published uh, uh, in Springer Nature last year. But those are numerous materials nowadays. The structure you can see in this cover image. Those materials are a couple of atoms seen where atoms of transition metal are connected by carbons or nitrogens. And they come, as you see, in a variety of different colors, unlike graphene, which is always uh, black. And uh, those are plasmonic colors, uh, by the way. Um, 
and also they offer a very wide variety of properties useful for numerous applications. Before uh, going to the subject, I just wanted to introduce you the university I work at. I've heard just from uh, one of your uh, colleagues uh, uh, who studied with uh, uh, a former colleague, uh, Professor Ndirana Pilan. But for some of you who don't know, it's a fairly old university, it's more than 125 years old. It was founded in 1892 by Anthony Drexel. And this is the oldest building, the first building of the university. You may be able to read here Drexel Institute because it was created as Institute of Technology. And engineering remains the strength. Anthony Drexel is the person who created the Wall Street, the person who built the modern financial system. He has lots of money and he gave money to create this university and actually his family uh, supported many other schools, universities in the United States. And particularly in my work, I focus on nanomaterials. So materials with nanoscale features, typically few atoms or single atoms seen like graphene, carbon nanotubes, maxines, and others here. And we coordinate many activities, including actually international partnership and collaborations of our university with colleagues abroad, student exchange and other programs. But my research group, particularly, has been working for many years on carbon materials. Again, from nanotubes to diamond nanoparticles, porous carbons, we explored various applications. Energy storage has been and is one of the main directions, but also medical application, water desalination. So whatever is important for the world, Whatever is important for the community, we have a couple of projects uh, using nanomaterials to overcome challenges from COVID-19 uh, virus now here. Because scientists and engineers should be at the forefront of uh, work, uh, at the frontier, uh, helping uh, humanity solve problems. In uh, for a long time, I've been working on carbon nanomaterials from fundamental science. You see many papers published in top journals, two applications. We got several awards. We started companies. We uh, translate research we do to technologies and sell licenses to companies. But what is important? We built our applied activities on a fundamental platform going from material discovery to full characterization, study of material properties to developing applications, here, and then transferring them to industry. Here. And over the past few years, my research largely shifted to two-dimensional materials. You don't need to be an expert in the field to hear know about graphene, which was separated in single layer form by Andrew Gaiman, Costa Novoselo from Manchester University in UK. In 2004, they received Nobel Prize uh, for it in uh, 2010. Uh, and uh, they uh, basically opened the door to research on other 2D materials. Scientists realized that actually two-dimensionality is common in the world. Boronitride is uh, hexagonal boronitride is isostructural to graphene, just replaying carbon atoms with borons and nitrogen in the same lattice. There are other materials. Clay, one of the most common materials used in technology for ages, clay is made of two dimensional particles. So if you take colloidal solution of clay, just put some clay in water, shake it, you will get some 2D particles floating them, and they used to reinforce polymers here. But what is also important, scientists realized that materials which were not known to exist in 2D form from black phosphorus to metal organic or uh, covalent organic frameworks to silicene 
germanine, others may also be made in two-dimensional state. And what is interesting, of course, these materials have exciting properties. They are different from bulk counterpart when they are made in 2D. And they have electronic properties ranging from semiconducting, metallic, insulating, metallic, other. They have mechanical flexibility because any material when very thin become flexible. And they are transparent because you can make a very thin film here. And also they have a large surface area, which is important for application ranging from adsorption and water purification to catalysis and energy storage. Here. And in 2011, Together with a colleague of mine, Professor Michelle Barzum at Drexel University and our PhD student at that time, Michael Nagib, we discovered that two carbides and nitrides, which were not known to exist in 2D form, not even predicted, can also form two-dimensional structures, where M stands for transition metal, X for carbon and nitrogen, and surfaces terminated with oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, hydrogen. So basically, M is one of the metal from this group. X is carbon and nitrogen. Surface termination come from these elements, but it was shown lately that sulfur, selenium, tellurium, uh, iodine, bromine can also terminate surface of maxims. So this research has been on the rise. There are more than 1,000 institutions in the world that publish on maxim. There were First conference on Maxine 2018 attracted 200 attendees. A year later, the number more, more than doubled. We had the third conference uh, in the fall October this year. And we also organized a conference at Drexel uh, last uh, summer in uh, August, July. And we had more than 2,000 registered participants. The field is clearly born. There were special issue of uh, advanced functional materials uh, and Chinese chemical letters on purely Maxine published this year, uh, last year. This year there will be uh, online issues uh, of um, advanced materials and ACS Nana. So basically the family keeps growing. There is tremendous attention of researchers and engineers around the world to these materials. Now, let me go a little bit deeper and explain how we make them. There is a large family of layered ceramic materials called max phases. Those are carbides of, or nitrides or carbon nitrides of those metals, marked in red here. But they have layers connected by monatomic layers of one of these A element in blue in the periodic table here. Professor Michel Barzuma, Drexel University, uh, is like the father of this field. He was not the one who discovered uh, the family of materials, but he was the one who developed them into materials, really, found applications in, at high temperatures, uh, nuclear reactors, very resistant ceramics. But it's not easy to separate those layers because the bonds here are not weak Van der Waals bonds, unlike graphene. The strong metallic or covalent bond between A element and M element, the red atoms here. So what we did to solve the problem, we etch them. We use the method I've been working on for many years on selective etching. We use it, for example, make carbons, carbide derived carbons. In this case, we didn't remove both metals. We removed only A element by using hydrofluoric acid and we created a number of different carbides. You can see some of them which were made first by uh, Michael Nagib in his PhD thesis, but there are more than 30 different materials now. So again, if you look at the structure at larger magnification, you will see black atoms, which are carbons. You will see red atoms, which are transition metals. And you will see green terminations which come from, again, oxygen uh, containing species in our process because we use aqueous etching, just acidic solutions. But again, it can be chlorine, bromine, other 
uh, elements if you use different methods of synthesis. So this actually surface termination stabilizes the surface and makes these materials environmentally stable. And the family keeps growing. We can make simple maxins. We can mix atoms randomly, making solid solution maxins. And since in most systems there is unlimited solubility, it means that theoretically, potentially, there is infinite number of compositions possible. But we can push atomic um, engineering to a next level. We can make atomic sandwiches where one element, for example, moly, is on the surface, another, for example, titanium is in the middle, or there can be two layers of one element and one of another. We call them um, out of plane ordered maxines. But it's possible also to alternate atomic columns of different elements within a single layer in M2C maxine structure. And even it's possible to selectively etch one layer, for example, yttrium or scandium away, leaving, for example, moly on the surface, making materials with mo uh, monatomic columnar divacances. So sky is the limit. There are more than 30 uh, stoichiometric compositions have been published, produced experimentally couple of dozens of solid solution on both M side and X side carbon nitrides published. And discovery will continue going on. Uh, just last year, a year ago, in the January issue of ICS Nano, we published a paper on another member of Max and Maxine family with five atomic layers of transition metals and four layers of carbon here. And that's certainly not the end. Discoveries continues. We now have really one more member of the family with five layer of transition metals. Actually, keep in mind what is very important. There are several monatomic 2D materials, many clay materials with two, three layers of atoms, but there are very few materials with like this, it's actually four carbons, five transition metals, and two layers of surface termination. It's a well-defined materials with 11 atomic layers. And this gives a different set of properties. And this is very interesting. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only 2D materials I know <clears throat> with defined structure in two dimensions of that particular thickness here. And just last year, Method etching of materials in organic solutions has been shown. Acid, uh, Lewis acid method in emulsion cell discovered. First superconductivity of maxine has been demonstrated uh, by uh, using, uh, again, emulsion cell synthesis. And just today in the morning, I uh, saw a new paper in advanced uh, in uh, ACS Nana published on etching of materials in organic solutions in bromine. So research continues, going on and expansion is very fast and every can contribute here. However, now we have this a large number of materials. What are they good for? Any materials is only good if it has some useful properties, some utility for people. And it has been predicted by density functional theory calculations. And I refer you to this very nice review published by Mohammed Hazei several years ago, that all bare non-terminated monolayer maxines are metallic. But surface terminations in some maxines can open band gap, some of them can stay metal. And actually, many applications I'm going to talk about today are based on metallicity of maxine, because there are many insulating and semiconducting two-dimensional materials. But there are no really good metals. Even uh, graphene, which people praise often for its uh, high conductivity, is a zero band gap semiconductor. Many of the maxines are true metals with a high density of state at the Fermi level, uh, high concentration of carriers, and high metallic conductivity also in thick films. Here. But some of those materials have been predicted to be magnetic, some predicted a semiconducting maxine having giant Z-B coefficients or potentially be useful thermoelectrics. 
Dirac fermion, so basically cons in the bond structure uh, have been predicted for fluorine terminated, for example, tenium to C. Tunable superconductivity already showed last year by Dmitry Talapin's group from University of Chicago. Ultra low work function, and yes, we can really vary it in very wide uh, range. Topological insulators, quantum uh, spin hole phase, uh, which is related to topological insulator, and so on. Moreover, those properties are predicted to be controllable by changing transition metal and also by changing surface termination. So one key thing I will be talking about all the time. These materials are tunable chemically tunable. You can change transition metal. You can change order of transition metal alignment in the lattice. You can change X element, carbon or nitrogen, their proportion. You can change surface chemistry and properties will change. And you can do it either discrete way by going from one structure to another in Maxine, or you can go do it in continuous way by making solid solution, just adding a few more atoms of one element here. And just to show you how the properties changed, let me give you an example of titanium 2C. This was actually one of the very first maxines discovered. Titanium 2C with no surface termination has a high density of state at the Fermi level, and just like all non-terminated maxine is metallic. However, if fluorine cover the surface bonding to titanium, you will see that uh, the band structure changes, the density of state at the Fermi level decreases. And now, if you put oxygen instead of fluorine on the surface and pull two electrons away from each titanium atoms, it's even predicted past to be possible to open the band gap. And this is just from the example. Very similar way, um, other properties change. Uh, some maxines have been predicted to have pretty wide uh, band gaps, but those have not been experimentally synthesized yet. To summarize properties on experimentally produced materials, the, one of the key properties is high conductivity. This is a multi-layer film of maxine, so we can measure currently up to 20,000 siemens per centimeter. Just to give you an idea, Reducing graphene oxide, which is the most common uh, multi-layer uh, graphene used uh, in applications, has about 10%, about 2,000 cement per centimeter. The best uh, reports show 4,000. These flakes are large and they are produced in solution. You will never make a 20 micron like this flake of moly disulfide. It will break apart. But Titanium 3C2 shown here is very strong, and actually niobium 4C3 M4 C3 maxines are even stronger. No one tested mechanically M5 C4 yet. These flakes, you see, they're for stiff, they follow hexagonal uh, structure of max phases, and you see it's a hanging actually in a hole of a grid on electron microscope. So it's a much more rigid because bending rigidity strongly depends on thickness and its order of magnitude more rigid compared than graphene. But it's a mono single crystal. You can see it from high resolution TM images, single atoms uh, arranged in a hexagonal lattice. You can see it from electron diffraction pattern of mono layer of maxine here. And because of surface termination, it's water soluble. It forms stable colloid solutions in water, so we can process it just from aqueous solution without additives. It has high surface area, just like all uh, two-dimensional materials here. It actually is plasmonic. It has plasmon resonance in visible or infrared range, showing a variety of colors. I showed you some pictures in uh, the first uh, cover image here. And it has, again, tunable properties I discussed uh, before, and there are many of them. Moreover, there is one other advantage, which is critical. There are now a couple of hundreds of two-dimensional materials described, produced. Most of them, 99% virtually, are made in tiny amounts, sometimes monolayer, 
sometimes this monolayer has to be protected under layers of graphene or another more stable material to exist, like gallium nitride. Borophin, uh, which was produced on silver, but no one can really separate large flakes and study their properties yet. From the day, uh, from the beginning, we were able to make maxine in large quantities. We have reactors in our lab that can go up to 100 gram synthesis were designed by a Ukrainian company for us. Anyone can buy them. Um, there are one kilogram already reactors in the industry. So this is a material produced in our lab. This is a 50 gram batch of material. And we can dissolve it after this in water. This is one liter bottle with concentrated solution of maxine. And we can use it, for example, by simple doctor blading process. We can make a film. This is like a one micron thick film, uh, one meter long, about 10 centimeter wide. It's very strong. It's strong actually than aluminum foil. The strength of this film is no binder, no nothing. Just spread and dry. It was 570 MPA. Actually, this is an arrow. It should be A after P. Standing here with conductivity of 15,000 siemens per centimeter. So it's an excellent material which can easily be produced in large quantities and processed into films. But you can, of course, use any known or convenient for you method. You can do 2D printing or 3D printing, stamping, uh, spin coating, spray coating, uh, interfacial monolayer assembly, all depends on what kind of film you need, whether you need freestanding film, self-supported film, thick, thin, transparent, or not. You can even spin them into fiber. If you take a highly concentrated solution of maxine, it will show liquid crystalline behavior because of two-dimensionality and hydrophilicity, high surface charge of the particle, zeta potential is uh, minus 30 to minus 80 millivolt usually here, and you can spin it into fiber. You can make maxine fiber. You see they are collected on a roll here. This work was published uh, in the February issue of uh, um, American Chemical Society premier journal ASEA Central Science last year. And you can see an ASEA micrograph of a single fiber. So <clears throat> you can manufacture it in a scalable way. So what does it practically mean? that this material can find potential applications not only in tiny electronic devices, but also in, say, battery supercapacitor electrode, membranes for water filtration, structural materials here. Moreover, if you look at many maxine, for example, titanium base, titanium 3C2, titanium 2C, titanium 3CN, it has earth abundant elements, titanium, carbon, T is here, oxygen uh, or OH. So there are elements which are abandoned in the earth. So they can be produced in large quantities. And if you develop good scalable process, it will become possible to also make them at a low cost. It is still to be done. There are challenges to overcome, but clearly potential is there. So they can make a much larger impact uh, compared to, say, materials uh, made uh, using noble metals or rare elements like tellurium uh, or others here. And of course, like any other 2D material, we can control the flake size. Um, we can use the same method that people have been using for, say, graphene oxide or molydisulfide. We can syndicate them, decrease their flake size smaller, we can separate them by sizes using, say, density gradient and solution, get particles of different sizes if we need them here. I already mentioned they are high strengths. Titanium 3C2 is stronger than any solution process material. Ideal boronitride or graphene crystal separated from large single crystals will be stronger. They have no defects, but again, for practical applications, we use material process from solution in the films and Titanium 3C2 is stronger, actually niobium 4C3, even stronger. It is somewhere uh, there in the modulus and about 30 gigapascal strengths here. <clears throat> also, I mentioned they have high conductivity. And what is important, they are conducting not only in a single flake, but also in a film in spite of thousands of junctions. So value conductivity I showed you before 
were for films, uh, like up to 20,000 cement per centimeter. But what is important, depending on the structure, they may have different uh, behaviors. And for example, titanium 32 will show in a wide range metallic behavior, while if you replace outer layers of titanium with moly, you can get semiconductor-like behavior here. And annealing removing functional groups allows you, for example, to increase conductivity often by a couple of orders of magnitude. Moreover, when you anneal it, and we showed this by annealing in vacuum, three different maxine, titanium-3C2, titanium carbon nitride, and moly-2, titanium-C2. This is this atomic sandwich maxine that I showed to you. Titanium-3C2 is metallic from the beginning. The resistivity decreases with increasing temperature. And if you cycle it, anneal, remove functional groups, remove intercalated molecules, it stays metallic. But carbon nitride and moly titanium C2 show semiconductor-like character of temperature dependence of a resistance. But as we remove surface functionality, functional groups, actually this behavior switches to metallic behavior because uh, as we discussed, uh, um, non-functionalized maxines are metallic, but even with some functional group on the surface, uh, many of them are metallic as long as interflake transport is uh, allowed and electron can easily jump from flake to flake. Here. We can control their work function. Uh, Ultra-low work function has been predicted for OH-terminated maxines. It can be very high up to eight electron volts for oxygen terminated maxines here. And uh, if you take titanium carbide uh, maxine, we showed that it's possible to change the work function again by annealing, removing OH will increase by about one electron volt the work function. If we anneal further, we start losing fluorine, we'll go back in the values uh, here. And this is what is expected actually to happen for titanium 3C2. The OH terminated material has lower loss function. We have a mix of termination on the surface, as you can see from this formula at the end here. And going to oxygen increases, removing uh, fluorine uh, decreases it. As a result, we get this again tunable behavior, tunable by surface chemistry. We can also change in a very wide range optical properties from UV to uh, really radio waves. So it means that applications are possible in many different uh, ranges. I will talk a little bit about optical properties today. What is important, in 2D materials, confinement happens within the layers. So it's not the size of the flake, which is always somewhat random. It is the thickness of the layer, and it's all the same as you know for different maxines composition determine confinement here. As a result, we can get all this plasmonic colors I showed you before, which are currently produced with noble metals, typically gold or silver. And a classical example of nanotechnology you will read in all books uh, you see in popular lectures is this uh, uh, Lekorgus cup uh, from uh, the fourth uh, century Roman here, which is in reflectance look green, in transmission look red because of plasmonic metal nanoparticles in glass. But this is exactly what Maxine showed. Titanium 2C in reflectance will give you green color. In transmission, when you look through in a dilute colloidal solution, if you, it gives you this reddish color. And every other Maxine will give you another couple of colors because of plasmon resonance peaks that you can see here. So those are tr transverse plasmons, surface plasmons, which are collective vibrations of the electrons in the lattice here. Will be different depending on Maxine. And again, you see they cover all the visible range, but many of them go further into infrared range. So we have materials with a wide range of properties. With surface plasmons that can use in plasmonic devices, that can use in surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, they can allow us to again control colors. So if you take films, make different thickness film, we again get basically colored film on the surface, 
with optical properties, which is again, we can predict, which we control. TSP stands for transfer surface plasmon. It's not absorption, I show it's transmission, so it's in different direction. And we can predict basically how its position will change as we add number of layers, for example, go from titanium 3C to C to titanium 3C2. As we replace in uh, M uh, to C structure titanium with vanadium, they will shift, they will give us different spectra. And in a solid solution, again, we can finely tune the color, we can finely tune the position of the surface plasmon by increasing, for example, titanium content. I'm running quickly through this because I don't have uh, that uh, much time, but the message you need to take uh, from this is that all properties are finely tunable. And this is very, very important. We have really like metallic materials with tunable conductivity, like transition, conventional metals. You take uh, gold, copper, you can inject charge, nothing happened to it. You cannot do much uh, to it. But with these materials, you can change their properties, you can tune them to application you need here. And of course, applications are emerging here. For example, uh, electromagnetic interference shielding. Maxins are the best, absolutely best EMI shielding materials. No, now and all electronic devices we need use need shielding. They're very good for making antennas for 5G application, others. They are highly conducting and they can be used as sensors for sensing motion, for sensing gas or uh, certain molecules from liquid that by intercalating between maxine layers change its conductivity. They can be used in solar cells because they have transparent conducting layers, replace, can replace ITO, indium tin oxide, but they also, their work function can be tuned to match the work function of the active material. And this is very important here. And I already mentioned plasmonic application photonics. Also, transition metals on the surface of this material can change their oxidation state. What does it mean? We can store energy electrochemically, just like in lithium ion battery, say, or supercapacitor. Here. And uh, you can imagine numerous applications for transparent conducting film and, of course, since plasmonic colors can be changed by injection charge, charges, we can make electrochromic devices. It comes to the stage that people already speculate, this is a term introduced by Professor Hussam Al-Sharif from KAUST about emergence of a field that called maxitronics. So electronic devices made of maxine totally because of so many different materials as we discussed from other structures to solid solution and different transition metals here because of their surfaces which have functional groups which allow further control through intercalation and surface charge because of tunable electronic properties work function band structure charge transport optical response here and all this array of application is emerging, especially when we talk about flexible devices, wearable devices, printable devices. This is exactly when we need materials like Maxine. Let me just give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> One example where Maxines have made real difference is application in electromagnetic interference shielding. This is a field where to protect electronic devices from electromagnetic noise, people have been using metals traditionally, metal foils, metal grids, uh, or lately carbon, but typically carbon like a composite, uh, for example, you can buy a clip to protect your uh, credit cards, which will be like a one and a half, two millimeters thick. What we showed in 2016, together with Professor Chen Min Ku from Korea, that titanium 3C2 maxine is actually lining up with copper and aluminum. But 
as I showed you before, we can make freestanding one micron thin film and achieve 50 decibel EMI shielding. 50 decibel means that 99.999% of electromagnetic radiation will be reflected or absorbed, not reaching the device. And this makes a tremendous difference. Graphene, for example, would require 70 to 80 micron film to achieve the same uh, shielding. It means that we can make much more thinner protection for small wearable electronics, for example. Moreover, electromagnetic interference shielding is a field where virtually nothing or very little progress was happening over years. For example, until we published this paper in Science in 2016, there was not a single paper on EMI shielding ever published in any of science or nature family journal, just because, again, there was no like a breakthrough, there was no uh, nothing extraordinary happening. Really, publication of this field completely like a change the world. People see EMI shielding and more work is appearing. And last summer, we published another paper, again with Professor Chen Min Ku in science, showing that titanium carbon nitride maxine shows actually even better EMI shielding, outperforming at the same thickness metal shields, bulk metals. We still don't completely understand the mechanism because it was always considered that shielding reflection particularly occurs due to free electrons in the material, and copper has like a two orders magnitude higher conductivity in bulk compared to titanium 3C and maxine, but clearly we have discrete interactions of separated layers with electromagnetic waves, and again, they're non-trivial and still need to be described at the fundamental level here. So, as you see, important breakthrough applications are emerging. They are coming as soon as we learn about the properties of the material. Here. There are many others. It's another collaborative work with Korean colleagues showing that Maxine can perform the same way as ITO in light emitting diodes, but unlike uh, ITO, it can be produced from solution. It's highly flexible. It doesn't break down. It doesn't crack when you bend your device. So you can build transparent LEDs by using uh, Maxine uh, layers here. Again, sensors, very unusual application for metallic materials. Most of gas sensors are semiconducting materials, which change their conductivity when gas molecules are absorbed. Usually you have to heat them like to 200 degrees C to make them sensitive. Maxine's are metallic, but they change their conductivity. As you already know, when you either adsorb molecules and even more when molecules are intercalated between maxine sheets. As a result, because of metallic conductivity, we get lower noise and we get very high signal to noise ratio. Again, very exciting application. I already mentioned electrochromism where we can change continuously the color of the film by injecting charge in an maxine film infiltrated by electrolyte. It's something similar to what you see, for example, in Boeing Dreamliner, uh, when you fly, when with pushing a button, you change the color of uh, the window here. So we can do the same thing with maxine, uh, for example, up to 170 nanometer uh, a shift was observed for titanium 3C2. So you can see it changes from color from green uh, to blue when minus one volt uh, potential is applied here. Okay, I think I used uh, 45 uh, minutes of your time already, and I want to leave uh, time for questions and discussion after the lecture. So I'm going to come towards the end of my lecture. I'm not going to show you like a long written conclu conclusions. The message I want to leave you with is that there is this large, already about 10 year old family of two dimensional materials with 
thicknesses from three atoms to 11 atoms here. With potentially a dozen of transition metals, including very common titanium, vanadium, uh, niobium, moly, uh, and carbon and nitrogen in the lattice. They can have also a variety of surface terminations. They can be arranged in solid solutions or layer structures, and of course you can envision more than two metals in a solid solution here. So like something like a high entropy systems. And it is a very, very controllable system. We can make each of them separately. We can study properties and we can explore application. Yes, to work with this number of materials, we need help from modeling and simulation. We need to be able to predict properties of these materials because we cannot produce every single one and an infinite number of solid solutions and study each of them in detail. We need guidance from density functional theory modeling of fundamental properties of these materials. We need to predict which metals will separate in layers which will form solid solution. We need to predict electronic and uh, chemical, electrochemical properties. But it can be done nowadays. It's also possible to move toward machine learning and artificial intelligence use to find in this family of materials the ones that are good for your application. For example, materials that absorb in near infrared can help to fight cancer, destroy tumors through uh, photothermal effect. And some other materials may have even much higher conductivity compared to what we have demonstrated. And chromium or manganese containing maxines can be magnetic. So it's again up to you to your, you younger scientists, next generation of researchers to explore properties of this enormous family of 2D materials, probably the largest known so far here. And of course, there are already emerging applications in the field. I really did not talk about energy storage applications and electrocatalysis, just simply because actually there is much more published. We work a lot in this area. First applications of Maxine that we demonstrated were in lithium ion batteries. They have been now tested and studied for use in all kinds of batteries. You can intercalate large multivalent ions between Maxine layers. They suppress the growth of lithium uh, or potassium dendrites. They can be used in lithium sulfur or sodium sulfur, potassium sulfur batteries to absorb um, polysulfides. This thin micron thin highly conducting films of Maxine I showed to you can be used as current collectors. And of course, high surface area allows the use in electrochemical capacitors, particularly we can make pseudo capacitors by utilizing surface redox. But if I start talking about this topic, this will be another big separate lecture on this. And some of these materials will suppress uh, hydrogen evolution and will be stable in a wide uh, range in org uh, aqueous electrolytes. Some of them will split water and will be good electrocatalysts for hydrogen or oxygen evolution reaction here. Um, there are applications, of course, in composites. Any strong thin material can be used as reinforcement in composites here. Maxine have been introduced into metal, polymer, and ceramic matrices. They can increase conductivity of ceramic and polymer composites and their strengths. They can also increase in light metals um, stiffness without loss of ductility. We showed that it's uh, together with Professor Talapin's group from University of Chicago that it's possible to double the modulus uh, of uh, light metal alloys without any change in ductility. I mentioned electromagnetic application. I talked about EMI shielding, but equally important are antennas. You can print out of Maxine antennas, which will be uh, just a few microns thin, but will show you the same performance pretty much as 
several times thicker and 10 times heavier copper film antennas for 5G application, for example. Here. Uh, it's possible to use maxins in iron sieving, air purification, gas separation, because they are two-dimensional, just like you imagine graphene oxide membrane, you can or clay uh, if you want. You can create membranes and they can be actually either supported or uh, freestanding for filtration separation. Here. Uh, I briefly mentioned uh, gas sensors, but since conductivity will change as you strain, bend the material a little bit, you can make also strain sensors, moisture sensor, electrochemical sensors, yeah. biomedical applications. The field started to emerge very recently, just like sensing. First paper were published just 2017, like three, four years ago. But there are already a couple of hundreds of publications largely focused on photothermal therapy for cancer treatment. But we are working in my group on dialysis. Maxines can adsorb urea. No other material is a good sorbent for urea. So we're working on developing wearable kidney using maxines here. Medical electrodes. Maxine can replace gold and silver in both implantable and epidermal electrodes here. I talked a little bit about optical application, but saturable absorber in femtosecond lasers uh, and um, photonic diodes and other applications are possible because of nonlinear optical properties of Maxine's here. We talk a little bit more about electronic applications, but again, from memory uh, to 2D magnets uh, to transparent conducting film, spintronic devices, all these applications are being considered here. And of course, what is very important, those materials that we can process, we can make them in larger than few, uh, few microgram or milligram quantities. We can actually make them in kilogram quantities already nowadays. Many of them are made of abandoned metals. But you also will see that almost like a half of research has been dedicated to a single maxine, titanium 32. It is the first one discovered, but there are many others. There are a couple of others studied more. All others take less than half, and there are so many transition metals here. This review published in 2017 as a cover article in Nature Reviews Materials is a good actually starting point to read. Of course, you can check our book to learn more. And of course, maxines are beautiful materials. Uh, every year we run non-artography competition. Everyone can submit. We have submissions from India. You can win prizes up to $700 currently. You can see your pictures in our annual calendar here uh, that you can find on uh, my website online uh, if you go to nana.materials.drexel.edu. And this is my very last slide here. Uh, of course, all this work that I showed today is done not just by myself. It is done by uh, my students, uh, uh, researchers. Uh, uh, it's actually winter 29, 22, uh, 20. So it was actually uh, January uh, 2020, but we have usually uh, our Christmas party at the end of the year. This year we could not get together because of COVID. We only had outings as a group. Uh, but I have a large, very productive research groups with people coming from many different countries, including India. Uh, we also collaborate with many people around the world, not only in the US, but really worldwide. We also receive funding from many different places. We have strategic partnership with some companies like a Japanese company, Murata, we work with researchers all over the world here. And I hope uh, you um, enjoyed listening about Maxine's. I know this is just like a first glimpse uh, uh, into this new field, new family of materials, but there is tremendous potential. And moreover, there is tremendous amount of work to do because of this very large number of composition very wide range of properties. So it means that if you're looking for a field to explore, if you're looking to area to work in, 
this is a great area because there is so much to discover. New maxine structure, new maxine composition, new properties, new, new application. It's all still open, so there are opportunities for everyone. Chemists, physicists, material scientists, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, people who do computational, people who do experimental research. There is room for everyone, and I want to encourage you consider this field. Think about Maxine, think how you can make new materials, develop new synthesis method, if you want to study their properties or develop new applications. With this, I'm going to stop and I will be glad to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was a very wonderful and an informative session. So uh, we have a few doubts uh, in our chat box. Mm -hmm. Uh, so would you mind me reading them out, sir? Yes, please. I read the questions. Yes, sir. The first question says, are magazine nanotubes and nanowires experimentally isolated? Um, not indeed. Nanowires or magazine scrolls, to say better have been produced and actually a scroll of Maxin was reported in the very first paper in Advanced Material 211. However, Maxin nanotubes have been theoretically predicted. It has been shown that larger diameter tubes will be more stable uh, because strain will be smaller, thinner M to C maxines uh, should be the most promising ones, but they have not been experimentally made yet. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I just lost the connectivity. Uh, mm -hmm. So the second question goes, as I know, magazines do not have standard cards for XRD and their presence is characterized by the peaks related to the 001 planes, especially at 2 theta below 10 degrees. If the max characteristic peak is removed after the acid washing process that is etching, but the mm -hmm. peaks of the 001 planes still remain about 10 degrees. Can it be said that magazines have been has been synthesized? Um, no, but you also cannot say that it has not been synthesized. Reason is very simple for pretty much all 2D materials. When especially they align in a film layers, the main and sometimes only peak you see is a 00L peak or series of peaks, 002 and so on. So what it shows you, it shows you spacing. For a known maxine, you also can calculate how much spacing is between the layers. So it's good to study intercalation. And of course, if you completely remove all max phase, the max phase peak, which is uh, it uh, higher position, will disappear. However, since max phase gives much stronger X-ray diffraction pattern compared to single layers with not uh, perfect ordering in your powder, you may still see just a few percent of max phase. So if you etched 90% of material, but you have 5% of unetched max phase there, you may still see max phase peaks here. And if your powder is randomly oriented particles, you may not really even see clearly 00L peaks. So what it practically means, there are two other things you can do. First, you can simply take a high resolution scan electron microscopy and see if you have particles etched. You can see it visually in a CM. Second, you can use other techniques, for example, like a Raman spectroscopy. And finally, of course, you can sonicate powder and after that, um, remove uh, supernatant, which should contain only maxine particles, uh, if you have a stable supernatant, and analyze it without impurity of max phase. So again, X-ray diffraction alone is not necessarily sufficient to tell how well you etched material or even if you have produced maxine.
Thank you, sir. Uh, so one of our participants would like to ask you a question. I'll just unmute him. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, actually, I see a couple of other uh, questions in the chat now here. Someone is asking, uh, how about Maxine for oxygen reduction reaction in fuel cells or metal air batteries? There are reports on this. However, Maxine oxidizes in air. So what does it practically mean? That you will have an oxide on the surface and Maxine underneath probably providing electron transport and support. In most cases, people also use maxine in combination with, say, nitrogen, dope, graphene, other material things here. I myself not working in that field. There are reports on use, but again, I think it will be just specific oxide structures produced from maxine, which again may have certain dimensionality, may have different properties from conventional oxides that truly do uh, the catalysis or electrocatalysis reaction here. Uh, also, I see another questions on uh, pseudocapacitors, <clears throat> and um, I'm asked to talk about potential of maxine and post-lithium ion battery technology. Uh, well, uh, you know, like, um, um, there is a big potential. People studied it for sodium, lithium, magnesium, calcium, and aluminum batteries. You can find publications. The review article in Nature Reviews materials that I showed you the cover of is actually dealing with a review of Maxine for energy related applications. It covers much of it, but of course it was published in 2017. There has been enormous progress since that. There are several review articles already uh, published on energy storage application. So we published very nice, highly cited paper last year in advanced materials on potassium batteries. We're showing that also suppresses growth of dendrites there. So there are many applications. I just uh, will need a lot of time to cover them just because there are so many of them here. And I think this was the last question in the chat, so it's probably time to give opportunity to people to ask questions verbally. Yes, so one of our participants, uh, Mr. Ali, has a question. I request him to kindly unmute and get the doubt clarified. You are probably muted. I cannot hear you. Hello. Uh, actually, my microphone was uh, disabled. Now it is all right. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was a great uh, discussion about Maxine's, and I would like to appreciate uh, the organizers of this uh, meeting and also you, Professor Gugutsi. It was great. I have a question about the application of Maxine that you uh, suggested they could be replaced uh, the silver or gold electrodes that are now used as implanting electrodes, for example, to, re uh, to record the signals. You said that uh, they, they could be replaced by Maxine. Now I'm wondering if we can make a pure electrode of Maxine material, or you mean that just we can coat them, coat the current electrodes that are used with Maxine layers, for example? Yeah. Uh, you can make a full electrode. You can actually do both. Uh, and we work with Professor Flavia Vitale at the University of Pennsylvania uh, on this subject. The first showed actually a uh, Maxine electrode with gold current collectors give a better signal to noise ratio when used as implantable electrodes in brain. And reason of this is not higher conductivity of maxine. Reason is better impedance matching uh, with uh, tissue. Uh, probably uh, also surface charge hydrophilicity allows us to do it here. But later they showed that maxine, purely film maxine, like I showed you, we can make, for example, one micron, few micron freestanding films with sufficient conductivity can be used very successfully. And unlike actually metal electrode for long-term measurements, 
uh, uh, for uh, example, for electromyography measurements, measuring muscle movement. You don't need any kind of a uh, grease. You don't need any kind of uh, uh, intermediate material which dries out uh, easily, uh, which is has to be used with metal electrodes. You just can put it on skin and it works and can stand for a longer time here. So yes, it's possible to make just pure Maxin uh, film electrodes uh, for all type of I think uh, measurements. Uh, Thank you. So you mean that both for wearable and implantable, both of them we can use uh, Maxine as the main <coughs> electrode, for example, yeah? Correct. Great. Thank Titan you. At much. least titanium carbide Maxines, tantalum carbide, number of others have been shown to be biocompatible, don't show any toxicity or uh, inf don't cause inflammatory uh, response. Um, uh, however, however, Whenever you talk about implantable electrodes, it's necessary to better understand, for example, what will be the lifetime in the body. Uh, will it last uh, for years? Will it last for months? How will response change over a longer time? This work is very new. It started relatively recently. So we definitely need to better understand uh, those factors before we can really tell, we can implant, for example, brain electrodes uh, uh, or uh, any other electrode to stimulate nerves, for example, in the body and use them uh, instead of gold. Yes, thank you very much. I also see another question in uh, the chat uh, about the yield of single few layer uh, Maxine flakes uh, here. Um, it really depends on your synthesis message independent on your material. Of course, we don't get 100% yield, but uh, potentially 50, 60% yield is possible. Uh, you can discard sediment if you work in a lab and just need small amount of material for characterization analysis you may not worry about, say, another 50% in the sediment, but you can continue washing, centrifuging, delamination, and extract much more maxin. If there is no binary carbide impurities or unreacted max phase, you can come close to 100%. There will always be losses because you will be losing it when washing, you will be losing it uh, when decanting, and so on here. So for the lab purposes, we often just leave sentiment alone, but there are also papers when people show that they can take uh, material in solution, single layer or few layer flakes, use them for studies for making transparent films, for example, something else where really delaminated two dimensional material is needed and use sediment to make, for example, battery electrodes or use it in other application when it doesn't matter there are a few percent of uh, impurities like max phases or, for example, titanium carbide binary because they're still conducting they don't kill properties, they just add a couple of percent of extra weight uh, to the material things here. So there are several ways you can handle it here. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Professor. I have a small quick question. You have been sure. mentioning about lots, lots of applications of these materials. Mm -hmm. From the experience of the Institute at Drexel, what has been the most successful commercial application in terms of bringing dollars? Well, um, this is a new material. As you know from actually conventional practice, it takes usually from 15 to 25 years for materials to make into real common applications, even graphene which got probably more investment, more attention than any other material ever discovered here, is still only making first steps into real life practical applications. 
Maxins, um, several applications of Maxin have been exclusively licensed, including electromagnetic shielding. And I think uh, shielding applications are probably, antenna applications are probably among the first one that can be realized because first they require a thin film of material. So it's not an expensive application here. Uh, second, uh, they are very, very common uh, in all electronics. So that's why I think it may be one of the first large volume, large scale applications. Um, I mentioned that say energy storage is important, but for energy storage, the limiting factor currently is not the performance. It will be the cost because those applications require a really large amount of material. Because again, many maxine like titanium 362 made of earth abundant element, it's certainly possible to push costs down because it's a matter of economy of scale. However, it needs to be done. So I guess I think first application will be the one in electronic transparent conducting films, electromagnetic shield plasmonic applications, uh, source sensors, for example, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy substrates, applications where amount of material is small, the cost of device uh, is high, so cost of material initially doesn't really matter, performance matters uh, there. And after that, it will probably step by step grow to other application, just like with other materials, just like this graphene. Thank you. I see another question in uh, the uh, feed. Um, someone asked uh, about uh, source quality of max uh, here. Well, source and quality of max is very important. Um, stoichiometry of maxin or max phase precursor is important. Grain size of max is important. Clearly, you know, like uh, since we make maxin from max phase, if your max phase has one micron size grains, you will never get uh, 10 micron or 20 micron maxin particles, right? So it means that you need to have grain size related to size of particles you want to produce. Also, non stoichiometric carbides will produce less stable maxine. We published a uh, couple of months ago a paper in archive. It is under review now in a journal. It's showing that we can make maxine which will last in colloidal solution of in water at room temperature in dilute solution for about a year if it is made stoichiometric. And uh, those are studies show importance of uh, max phase precursor here. We both make our own max phases, uh, particularly if we need some kind of a rare maxine composition, special composition. We also buy max phase from Carbon Ukraine. This is one of the company produces, as we know, makes materials of good quality we can use. So we use both, we use commercial material and we make our own max phases when we need uh, to have better control. Um, there is another question I see. Someone asked me about aqueous zinc ion battery electrode materials here. Yes, this is like the latest battery application. I did not mention it in uh, my slide. There have been a couple of very interesting papers recently, not from our group, uh, from other research groups. I think it is very promising. Mm -hmm. uh, long term stability again, you need to make Maxine with the required quality to assure long term stability there. But the papers at least I saw published show there is a promise. Uh, someone else asked also about why uh, mostly use aluminum based max phase materials here. Um, well, there are a couple of reasons. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is 
aluminum is the cheapest of oil, all A element. Uh, silicon is next one. And it's also easier to remove. We showed we can etch out silicon, but it requires using oxidizer, so Maxine gets partially oxidized. We made a uh, moly uh, carbide using gallium containing phase. Actually, there are two layers of gallium there, so it's not technically exactly max phase, it's similar layered carbide. Actually, there are many other layered carbides that can be used. Uh, for example, zirconium aluminum carbides as precursors. So aluminum is the cheapest one, but purely scientifically, it would be interesting to etch out other elements like tin, like sulfur. Um, it's a worth of trying. Someone asks about uh, Sigma Aldrich source of max phase. Yes, I think it is reliable, but it has some secondary phases like uh, transition metal carbides. So yes, you can make good quality maxine, uh, but you will need to wash away uh, residual carbides from it after synthesis. Sigma Aldrich is also going to start selling maxines in their less latest magazine they uh, already advertised maxines so uh, you will be able to buy it from sigma uh, it's so actually called millipore sigma now uh, millipore bought the company uh, so maxine will also appear eventually or several maxines in their catalog thank you sir uh, i think we're done with the questions mm -hmm. Okay, uh, very good, Kimaya. Uh, so again, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me an opportunity to uh, speak to you. Uh, I enjoy also question our discussion. You have my email, you have a link uh, to uh, my uh, website if you are interested in learning more. You can also download our papers from my website. Uh, they are in PDF format, but password protected. Password is very simple. It's NMG, all small letters standing from nanomaterials group. So first letters, NMG as a password. So you can read more. You can watch a video on our website. If you click on uh, this website about Maxine in our laboratory and learn more about the material. Again, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, goodbye, good night, everyone. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, uh, some of you uh, will uh, consider a career uh, in the Maxine field. Definitely. Thank you, Professor, for your very informative and inspiring lecture. The students really benefited from your session. It is very kind of you to spare your precious time for our students. We are very grateful to you. And uh, as an individual, I request you to kindly pass on my regards to Professor Michelle Barsoom. Uh, we are from the second batch of the students whom he taught uh, in Drexel after he moved from MIT. It's really mm -hmm. nice. It is uh, bringing a lot of pleasant memories to me about Drexel. It was nice to see the building also. It is a very, very nicely organized lecture. So oh, in yeah. addition to your excellence in research, the performance as a speaker, it is very impressive. Most of the audience, undergraduate uh, material students, they could definitely follow your session. Thanks a lot, Professor. Thank you. Uh, look, it's uh, my pleasure. And again, thank you very much for invitation. I will certainly say hi to Michelle. We are in the same department with him. And we had a lot of collaborative work, as you could see from publications. Well, goodbye, everyone. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. goodbye. Have a nice day, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you all.